Chapter 22 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet Friday. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 22 An Independent Family. The Common Skunk. Hognosed or Badger Skunk, and Little Spotted Skunk. Just as Old Mother Nature asked who they should learn about next, Happy Jack Squirrel spied someone coming down the lone little path. See who's coming! cried Happy Jack. Everybody turned to look down the lone little path. There, Ambling along in the most matter-of-fact and unconcerned way imaginable came a certain small person who was dressed wholly in black and white. "'Hello, Jimmy Skunk!' cried Chatterer the Red Squirrel. "'What are you doing over here in the green forest?' Jimmy Skunk looked up and grinned. It was a slow, good-natured grin. "'Hello, everybody,' said he. "'I thought I would just amble over here and see your school. "'I suppose all you fellows are getting so wise "'that pretty soon you will think you know all there is to know.' Have any of you seen any fat beetles around here? Just then, Jimmy noticed Old Mother Nature and hastened to bow his head in a funny way. Please excuse me, Mother Nature, he said. I thought school was over. I don't want to interrupt. Old Mother Nature smiled. The fact is, Old Mother Nature is rather fond of Jimmy Skunk. You aren't interrupting, said she. The fact is, we had just ended the lesson about Flitter the Bat and his relatives, and were trying to decide who to study about next. I think you came along at just the right time. You belong to a large and rather important order, one that all these little folks here ought to know about. How many cousins have you, Jimmy? Jimmy Skunk looked a little surprised at the question. He scratched his head thoughtfully. Let me see, said he. I have several close cousins in the skunk branch of the family, but I presume you want to know who my cousins are outside of the skunk branch. They are Shadow the Weasel, Billy Mink, and Little Joe Otter. These are the only ones I can think of now. How about Digger the Badger? asked Old Mother Nature. A look of surprise swept over Jimmy Skunk's face. Digger the Badger? he exclaimed. Digger the Badger is no cousin of mine. Tut, 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 chided old Mother Nature. Tut, 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 Jimmy Skunk. It is high time you came to school. Digger the Badger is just as much a cousin of yours as is Shadow the Weasel. You are members of the same order, and it is a rather large order. It is called... The carnivora, which means flesh eating. You are a member of the marten or weasel family, and that family is called the mustel it day. Digger the badger is also a member of that family. That means that you two are cousins. You and Digger and Glutton the wolverine belong to the stout bodied branch of the family. Billy Mink, Little Joe Otter, Shadow the Weasel, 
Pecan the fisher and Spite the marten belong to its slim-bodied branch, but all are members of the same family, despite the difference in looks, and thus, of course, are cousins. Seeing that you are here, Jimmy, I think we will find out just how much these little folks know about you. Peter Rabbit, tell us what you know about Jimmy Skunk. I know one thing about him, declared Peter, and that's that he is the most independent fellow in the world. He isn't afraid of anybody. I saw Buster Bear actually step out of his way the other day. Jimmy Skunk grinned. Buster always treats me very politely, said Jimmy. I have noticed that everybody does. Even Farmer Brown's boy spoke up Happy Jack Squirrel. It is easy enough to be independent when everybody is afraid of you, sputtered Chatterer the Red Squirrel. Just why is everybody afraid of Jimmy Skunk? asked Old Mother Nature. They are afraid of that little scent gun he carries, spoke up Peter Rabbit. I wish I had one just like it. Old Mother Nature shook her head. It wouldn't do, Peter, to trust you with a gun like Jimmy Skunk's, said she. You are altogether too heedless and careless. If you had a scent gun like Jimmy's, I am afraid there would be trouble in the green forest and on the green meadow all the time. I suspect that you would drive everybody else away. Jimmy is never heedless or careless. He never uses that little scent gun unless he is in real danger or thinks he is. Usually he is pretty sure that he is before he uses it. I'll venture to say that not one of you has seen Jimmy use that little scent gun. Peter looked at Jumper the Hare. Jumper looked at Chatterer. Chatterer looked at Happy Jack. Happy Jack looked at Danny Meadow Mouse. Danny looked at Striped Chipmunk. Striped looked at Johnny Chuck. Johnny looked at Whitefoot the Wood Mouse. Then all looked at Old Mother Nature and shook their heads. I thought as much, said she. Jimmy is wonderfully well armed, but for defense only, he never makes the mistake of misusing that little scent gun. But everybody knows he has it, so nobody interferes with him. Now, Peter, what more do you know about Jimmy? He's lazy, replied Peter. I'm not lazy, retorted Jimmy Skunk. I'm no more lazy than you are. You call me lazy just because I don't hurry. I don't have to hurry. And I never can see any good in hurrying when one doesn't have to. That will do, interposed old Mother Nature. Go on, Peter, with what you know about Jimmy. He is good-natured, said Peter, and grinned at Jimmy. Jimmy grinned back. Thank you, Peter, said he. He is one of the best-natured people I know, continued Peter. I guess it is a lucky thing for the rest of us that he is. I have noticed that fat people are usually good-natured, and Jimmy is nearly always fat. In fact, I don't think I have seen him what you would call really thin, excepting very early in the spring. He eats beetles and grubs and grasshoppers and crickets and insects of all sorts. I am told that he steals eggs when he can find them. Yes, and he catches members of my family when he can, spoke up Danny Meadow Mouse. 
I never feel safe with Jimmy Skunk very near. Jimmy didn't look at all put out. I might as well confess. Tender Mouse is rather to my liking, said he. And I might add that I also enjoy a frog now and then, or a lizard, or a fish. Also, you might mention that young birds don't come amiss when you can get them, spoke up Chatterer the Red Squirrel maliciously. Jimmy looked up at Chatterer. That's a case of the pot calling the kettle black, said he, and Chatterer made a face at him. But Chatterer said nothing more, for he knew that all the others knew that what Jimmy said was true. Chatterer had robbed many a nest of young birds. Is that all you know about Jimmy? asked Old Mother Nature of Peter. I guess it is, replied Peter, excepting that he lives in a hole in the ground, and I seldom see him out in winter. I rather think he sleeps all winter, the same as Johnny Chuck does. You've got another think coming, Peter, said Jimmy. I sleep a lot during the winter, but I don't go into winter quarters until well after snow comes, and I don't sleep the way Johnny Chuck does. Sometimes I go out in winter and hunt around a little. Do you dig your house? asked Old Mother Nature. Jimmy shook his head. Not when I can help myself, said he. It is too much work. If I have to, I do, but I would much rather use one of Johnny Chuck's old houses. His houses suit me first rate. I want you all to look at Jimmy very closely, said Old Mother Nature. You will notice that he is about the size of Black Pussy. The cat from Farmer Brown's, and that his coat is black with broad white stripes, but not all skunks are marked alike. I dare say that no two of Jimmy's children would be exactly alike. I suspect that one or more might be all black, with perhaps a little bit of white on the tail. Notice that Jimmy's front feet have long, sharp claws. He uses these to dig out grubs and insects in the ground, and for pulling over sticks and stones in his search for beetles. Also notice that he places his feet on the ground very much as does Buster Bear. That big bushy tail of his is for the purpose of warning folks. Jimmy never shoots that little scent gun without first giving warning. When that tail of his begins to go up in the air, wise people watch out. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that Jimmy Skunk and his family do a great deal of harm. The truth is, they do a great deal of good to man. Once in a while, they will make the mistake of stealing chickens or eggs, but it is only once in a while. They make up for all they take in this way by the pests they destroy. Jimmy and Mrs. Skunk have a large family each year, usually from six to ten. Mrs. Skunk usually is living by herself. When the babies are born, but when they are big enough to walk, their father rejoins the family, and you may see them almost any pleasant evening, starting out together to hunt for grasshoppers, beetles, and other things. Often the whole family remains together the whole winter, not breaking up until spring. Jimmy is one of the neatest of all my little people, and takes the best care of his handsome coat. He isn't afraid of water, and can swim if it is necessary. He does most of his hunting at night, sleeping during the day, 
He is one of the few little wild people who haven't been driven away by man, and often makes his home close to man's home. Jimmy has cousins in nearly all parts of this great country. Way down in the southwest is one called the hog-nosed skunk, one of the largest of the family. He gets his name because of the shape of his nose and the fact that he roots in the ground the same as a hog. He is also called the badger skunk because of the big claws on his front feet and the fact that he is a great digger. His fur is not so fine as that of Jimmy Skunk, but is rather coarse and harsh. He is even more of an insect eater than is Jimmy. The smallest of Jimmy's own cousins is the little spotted skunk. He is only about half as big as Jimmy, and his coat, instead of being striped with white like Jimmy's, is covered with irregular white lines and spots, making it appear very handsome. He lives in the southern half of the country and inhabits is much like Jimmy, but he is much livelier. Occasionally he climbs low trees. Like Jimmy, he eats almost anything he can find. And it goes without saying that, like Jimmy, he carries a little scent gun. By the way, Jimmy, what do you do when you are angry? Show us. Jimmy began to growl, a queer-sounding little growl, and at the same time to stamp the ground with his front feet. Old Mother Nature laughed. Oh, when you see Jimmy do that, said she, it is best to pretend you don't see him and keep out of his way. Hasn't Jimmy any enemies at all? asked Peter Rabbit. That depends on how hungry some folks get, replied Old Mother Nature. Hooty the Owl doesn't seem to mind Jimmy's little scent gun, but this is the only one I can think of who doesn't. Some of the bigger animals might take him if they were starving, but even then I think they would think twice. Who knows where Digger the Badger is living? I do, replied Peter Rabbit. He is living out on the green meadows over near the old pasture. All right, Peter, replied Old Mother Nature. Suppose you run over and pay him a visit, and tomorrow morning you can tell us about it. End of chapter 22 Recording by Janet Friday Three of the Burgess Animal Book for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess Chapter 23 Digger and his cousin, Glutton the Badger, and Wolverine, or Caracajou. "'Well, Peter,' said Old Mother Nature, "'did you visit Digger the Badger yesterday?' "'Yes, am replied Peter. "'I visited him, but I didn't find out much. "'He's a regular old grouch. "'He isn't the least bit neighborly. "'It took me a long time to find him. "'He has more holes than anybody I ever knew, "'and I couldn't tell which one is his home. "'When I did find him, he gave me a terrible scare. "'I didn't see him until I was right on top of him, "'and if I hadn't jumped, and quickly, I guess I wouldn't be here this morning. He was lying flat down in the grass, and he was so very flat that I just didn't see him. When I told him that I wanted to know all about him and his ways, he replied that it was none of my business how he lived or what he did, and that was all I could get out of him. I sat around a while and watched him, but he didn't do much except take a sun bath. He certainly is a queer-looking fellow to be a member of the weasel family. There's nothing about him that looks like a weasel that I could see. Of course, he isn't as broad as he is long, 
but he looks almost that when he is lying flat down, and that long hair of his is spread out on both sides. He really has a handsome coat, when you come to look at it. It is silvery grey and silky looking. It seems to be parted right down the middle of his back. His tail is rather short, but stout and hairy. His head and face are really handsome. His cheeks, chin, and a broad stripe from his nose right straight back over his head are white. On each cheek is a bar of black. The back part of his ear is black, and so are his feet. He has rather a sharp nose. Somehow, when he is walking, he makes me think of a little flattened-out bear with very short legs. And such claws as he has on his front feet! I don't know any one with such big strong claws for his size. I guess that must be because he is such a digger. That's a very good guess, Peter, said Old Mother Nature. Has any one here ever seen him dig? I did once, replied Peter. I happened to be over near where he lives when Farmer Brown's boy came along and surprised Digger some distance from one of his holes. Digger didn't try to get into one of those holes. He simply began to dig. My gracious, how the sand did fly! He was out of sight in the ground before Farmer Brown's boy could get to him. Johnny Chuck is pretty good at digging, but he simply isn't in the same class with Digger the Badger. No one is that I know of, unless it's Miner the Mole. I guess this is all I know about him, excepting that he is a great fighter. Once I saw him whip a dog almost twice his size. I never heard such hissing and snarling and growling. He wouldn't tell me anything about how he lives. Very good, Peter, very good, replied Old Mother Nature. That's as much as I expected you would be able to find out. Digger is a queer fellow. His home is on the great plains and in the flat open country of the Middle West and Far West, where gophers and ground squirrels and prairie dogs live. They furnish him with the greater part of his food. All of them are good diggers, but they don't stand any chance when he sets out to dig them out. Digger spends most of his time underground during daylight, seldom coming out except for a sun bath. But as soon as jolly round red Mr. Sun goes to bed for the night, Digger appears and travels about in search of a dinner. His legs are so short, and he is so stout and heavy, that he is slow and rather clumsy, but he makes up for that by his ability to dig. He doesn't expect to catch any one on the surface, unless he happens to surprise a meadow mouse within jumping distance. He goes hunting for the holes of the ground squirrels and other burrowers, and when he finds one, promptly digs. He eats grasshoppers, beetles, and small snakes, as well as such small animals as he catches. It was well for you, Peter, that you jumped when you did, for I suspect that Digger would have enjoyed a rabbit dinner. Very little is known of Digger's family life, but he is a good husband. In winter he sleeps as Johnny Chuck does, coming out soon after the snow disappears in the spring. Of all my little people, none has greater courage. When he is cornered, he will fight as long as there is a breath of life in him. His skin is very tough, and he is further protected by his long hair. His teeth are sharp and strong, and he can always give a good account of himself in a fight. He is afraid of no one of his own size. Man hunts for him, for his fur, but man is very stupid in many things, and this is an example. You see, Digger is worth a great deal more alive than dead, because of the great number of destructive rodents he kills. The only thing that can be brought against him is the number of holes he digs. Mr. and Mrs. Digger have two to five babies late in the spring or early in the summer. They are born underground in a nest of grass. As you may guess, just by looking at Digger, he is very strong. If he once gets well into the ground, a strong man pulling on his tail cannot budge him. As Peter has pointed out, he isn't at all sociable. Mr. and Mrs. Digger are quite satisfied to live by themselves and be left alone. So he is rarely seen in daytime, but probably is out oftener than is supposed. Peter has told how he nearly stepped on Digger before seeing him. It is Digger's wise habit to lie perfectly still until he is sure he has been seen, so people often pass him without seeing him at all, or if they see him, they take him for a stone. 
while Digger the Badger is a lover of the open country and doesn't like the green forest at all. He has a cousin who is found only in the green forest, and usually very deep in the green forest at that. This is Glutton the Wolverine, the largest and ugliest member of the family. None of you have seen him, because he lives almost wholly in the great forests of the north. He hasn't a single friend that I know of, but that doesn't trouble him in the least. Glutton has several names. He is called Karakaju in the far north, and out on the far west is often called Skunk Bear. The latter name probably is given him because in shape and color he looks a great deal as though he might be half skunk and half bear. He is about three feet long with a tail six inches long and is thick set and heavy. His legs are short and very stout. His hair, including that on the tail, is long and shaggy. It is blackish brown, becoming grayish on the upper part of his head and cheeks. His feet are black. When he walks, he puts his feet flat on the ground, as a bear does. Being so short of leg and heavy of body, he is slow in his movements. But what he lacks in this respect, he makes up in strength and cunning. You think Reddy Fox and Old Man Coyote are smart, but neither begins to be as smart as Glutton the Wolverine. He is a great traveler, and in the far north, where the greater part of the fur of the world is trapped, he is a pest to the trappers. He will follow a trapper all day long, keeping just out of sight. No matter how carefully a trapper hides a trap, Glutton will find it and steal the bait without getting caught. Sometimes he even tears up the traps and takes them off and hides them in the woods. If he comes on a trap in which some other animal has been caught, he will eat the animal. His strength is so great that often he will tear his way into the cabins of hunters while they are absent and eat or destroy all their food. His appetite is tremendous, and it is because of this that he is called glutton. What he cannot eat or take away, he covers with filth, so that no other animal will touch it. He is of ugly disposition, and is hated alike by the animals and by man. His fur is of considerable value, but he is hunted more for the purpose of getting rid of him than for his fur. Sometimes when caught in a trap, he will pick it up and carry it for miles. Mrs. Glutton has two or three babies in the spring. They live in a cave, but if a cave cannot be found, they use a hole in the ground which Mrs. Glutton digs. It is usually well hidden and seldom has been found by man. Glutton will eat any kind of flesh and seems not to care whether it is freshly killed or so old that it is decayed. The only way that hunters can protect their supplies is by covering them with great logs. Even then the glutton will often tear the logs apart to get at the supplies. Because of his great cunning, the Indians think he is possessed of an evil spirit. I think this will do for today. Tomorrow we will take up another branch of the family, some members of which all of you know. I wonder if it wouldn't be a good plan to have Shadow the Weasel here. Such a look of dismay as swept over the faces of all those little people, with the exception of Jimmy Skunk and Prickly Porky. If... "'If you please, I don't think I'll come tomorrow morning,' said Danny Meadow Mouse. "'I... I... I think I shall be too busy at home, and will have to miss that lesson,' said Striped Chickmunk. Old Mother Nature smiled. "'Don't worry, little folks,' said she. "'You ought to know that if I had Shadow here, I wouldn't let him hurt one of you. But I am afraid if he were here, you would pay no attention to me. So I promise you that Shadow will not be anywhere near.' End of chapter 23《4 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet Friday. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 24 shadow and his family the common or bonaparte weasel or ermine new york weasel long-tailed or yellow-bellied weasel least weasel 
and black-footed ferret. Every one was on hand when school opened the next morning, despite the fear that the mere mention of Shadow the Weasel had aroused in all, save Jimmy Skunk and Prickly Porky. You see, all felt they must be there so that they might learn all they possibly could about one they so feared. It might help them to escape should they discover Shadow hunting them some time. "'Striped Chipmunk,' said Old Mother Nature, "'you know something about Shadow the Weasel. Tell us what you know.' "'I know I hate him,' declared Striped Chipmunk, and all the others nodded their heads in agreement. "'I don't know a single good thing about him,' he continued. "'But I know plenty of bad things. He is the one enemy I fear more than any other.' because he is the one who can go wherever I can. Any hole I can get into, he can. I've seen him just twice in my life, and I hope I may never see him again. What did he look like? asked Old Mother Nature. Like a snake on legs, declared Striped Chipmunk. Anyway, that is what he made me think of because his body was so long and slim, and he twisted and turned so easily. He was about as long as Chatterer the Red Squirrel, but looked longer because of his slim body and long neck. He was brown above and white below. His front feet were white, and his hind feet rather whitish, but not clear white. His short, round tail was black at the end, Somehow his small head and sharp face made me think of a snake. Ugh! I don't like to think about him. I saw him once, and he wasn't brown at all. Striped Chipmunk is all wrong. Excepting about the end of his tail, interrupted Jumper the Hare. He was all white, every bit of him, but the end of his tail, that was black. "'Striped Chipmunk is quite right, and so are you,' declared Old Mother Nature. "'Striped Chipmunk saw him in summer, and you saw him in winter. "'He changes his coat according to season, just as you do yourself, Jumper. "'In winter he is trapped for his fur, and he isn't called Weasel at all, but Ermine.' "'Oh,' said Jumper and looked as if he felt a wee bit foolish. "'What was he doing when you saw him?' asked Old Mother Nature, turning to Striped Chipmunk. "'Hunting,' replied Striped Chipmunk, as he shivered. "'He was hunting me! "'He had found my tracks where I had been gathering beech nuts, "'and he was following them with his nose, "'just the way Bowser the Hound follows Reddy Fox.' I nearly died of fright when I saw him. You are lucky to be alive, declared Chatterer the Red Squirrel. I know it, replied Striped Chipmunk and shivered again. I know it. I guess I wouldn't be if Reddy Fox hadn't happened along just then and frightened Shadow away. I've had a kindlier feeling for Reddy Fox ever since. I never ran harder in my life than the time I saw him, spoke up Jumper the Hare. He was hunting me just the same way, running with his nose in the snow and following every twist and turn I had made. But for that black-tipped tail, I wouldn't have seen him until too late. Pooh! exclaimed Jimmy Skunk. The idea of a big fellow like you running from such a little fellow as my cousin Shadow. I'm not ashamed of running, declared Jumper. I may be ever so much bigger, but he is so quick, I wouldn't stand the least chance in the world. When I suspect Shadow is about, I go somewhere else, the farther the better. If I could climb a tree like Chatterer, it would be different. No, it wouldn't, interrupted Chatterer. 
That fellow can climb almost as well as I can. The only thing that saved me from him once was the fact that I could make a long jump from one tree to another, and he couldn't. He had found a hole in a certain tree where I was living, and it was just luck that I wasn't at home when he called. I was just returning when he popped out. I ran for my life. He is the most awful fellow in all the great world," declared Whitefoot the Wood Mouse. Jimmy Skunk chuckled right out. "A lot you know about the great world," he said. "Why, you are farther from home now than you've ever been in your life before. Yet I could walk it in a few minutes." How do you know Shadow is the most awful fellow in the great world? I just know that's all," retorted Whitefoot in a very positive, though squeaky voice. He hunts and kills just for the love of it, and no one, no matter how big he is, can do anything more awful than that. I have a lot of enemies. Sometimes it seems as if almost every one of my neighbors is looking for a mouse dinner, but all but Shadow the Weasel hunt me when they are hungry and need food. I can forgive them for that. Every one must eat to live, but Shadow hunts me even when his stomach is so full, he cannot eat another mouthful. That fellow just loves to kill. He takes pleasure in it. That is what makes him so awful. Whitefoot is right," declared Old Mother Nature, and she spoke sadly. If Shadow was as big as Buster Bear or Puma the Panther, or even Tufty the Lynx, he would be the most terrible creature in all the great world, because of this awful desire to kill, which fills him. He is hot-blooded, quick-tempered, and fearless. Even when cornered by an enemy against whom he has no chance, he will fight to the last gasp. I am sorry to say there is no kindness nor gentleness in him towards any save his own family. Outside of that, he hasn't a friend in the world, not one. Hasn't he any? Enemies? Asked Peter Rabbit. Oh yes, replied Old Mother Nature. Reddy Fox, Old Man Coyote, Hooty the Owl, and various members of the Hawk family have to be watched for by him, but they do not worry him much. You see, he moves so quickly, dodging out of sight in a flash. That whoever catches him must be quick indeed. Then too, he is almost always close to good cover. He delights in old stone walls, stone piles, brush-grown fences, piles of rubbish and barns and old buildings, the places that mice delight in. In such places, there is always a hole to dart into in time of danger. He hunts whenever he feels like it. Be it day or night, and often covers considerable ground, though nothing to compare with his big brown water-loving cousin Billy Mink. It is because of his wonderful ability to disappear in an instant that he is called Shadow. Shadow is known as the common weasel, short-tailed weasel, brown weasel, Bonaparte weasel, and ermine. And is found all over the forested parts of the northern part of the country. A little farther south, in the east, is a cousin very much like him, called the New York weasel. On the Great Plains of the West is a larger cousin with a longer tail, called the long-tailed weasel, large ermine or yellow-bellied weasel. His smallest cousin is the least weasel. The latter is not much longer than a mouse. In winter, he is all white, even the tip of his tail. In summer, he is a purer white underneath than his larger cousins. 
All of the weasels are alike in habits. When running, they bound over the ground much as Peter Rabbit does. In that part of the West where Yap Yap the prairie dog lives is a relative called the black-footed ferret, who looks like a large weasel. He is about the size of Billy Mink, but instead of the rich dark brown of Billy's coat, his coat is a creamy yellow. His feet are black, and so is the tip of his tail. His face is whitish with a dark band across the eyes. He is most frequently found in prairie dog towns, and lives largely on Yap Yap and his friends. His ways are those of Shadow and his cousins. There is no one Yap Yap fears quite as much. The one good thing Shadow the Weasel does is to kill Robber the Rat whenever they meet. Robber, as you know, is big and savage, and always ready for a fight when cornered. But all the fight goes out of him when Shadow appears. Perhaps it is because he knows how hopeless it is. When Shadow finds a barn overrun with rats, he will sometimes stay until he has killed or driven out the last one. Then perhaps he spoils it all by killing a dozen chickens in a night. It is a sad thing not to be able to speak well of any one, but Shadow the Weasel, like Robber the Rat. Has by his ways made himself hated by all the little people of the green forest and the green meadows, and by man. There is not one to say a good word for him. Now tomorrow we will meet on the bank of the smiling pool instead of here. End of chapter twenty-four. Recording by Janet Friday. Chapter twenty-five. Of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess, Chapter Twenty Five. Two famous swimmers, Billy Mink and Little Joe Otter. The bank of the smiling pool was a lovely place to hold school at that hour of the day, which you know was just after sunup. Everybody who could get there was on hand, and there were several who had not been to school before. One of these was Grandfather Frog, who was sitting on his big green lily pad. Another was Jerry Muskrat, whose house was out in the smiling pool. Spotty the Turtle was also there, not to mention Longlegs the Heron. You see, they hadn't come to school, but the school had come to them, for that is where they live or spend most of their time. Good morning, Jerry Muskrat," said Old Mother Nature pleasantly as Jerry's brown head appeared in the smiling pool. "Have you seen anything of Billy Mink or Little Joe Otter?" "Little Joe went down to the Big River last night," replied Jerry Muskrat. "I don't know when he is coming back, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him any minute." Billy Mink was here last evening and said he was going up the Laughing Brook fishing. He is likely to be back any time. One can never tell when that fellow will appear. He comes and goes continually. I don't believe he can keep still five minutes. Who is that can't keep still five minutes? Demanded a new voice, and there was Billy Mink himself just climbing out on the big rock. Jerry was speaking of you, replied Old Mother Nature. This will be a good chance for you to show him that he is mistaken. I want you to stay here for a while and to stay right on the big rock. I may want to ask you a few questions. Just then, Billy Mink dived into the smiling pool, and a second later, his brown head popped out of the water, and in his mouth was a fat fish. He scrambled back on the big rock and looked at Old Mother Nature a bit fearfully as he laid the fish down. I I didn't mean to disobey," he mumbled. I saw that fish and dive for him before I thought. I hope you will forgive me, Mother Nature. I won't do it again. Acting before thinking gets people into trouble sometimes," replied Old Mother Nature. However, I will forgive you this time. The fact is, you have just shown your friends here something. Go ahead and eat that fish and be ready to answer questions. As Billy Mink sat there on the big rock, everyone had a good look at him. 
one glance would tell anyone that he was a cousin of Shadow the Weasel. He was much larger than Shadow, but of the same general shape, being long and slender. His coat was a beautiful dark brown, darkest on the back. His chin was white. His tail was round, covered with fairly long hair which was so dark as to be almost black. His face was like that of Shadow the Weasel. His legs were rather short. As he sat eating that fish, his back was arched. Old Mother Nature waited until he had finished his feast. Now then, Billy, said she, I want you to answer a few questions. Which do you like best, night or day? It doesn't make any particular difference to me, replied Billy. I just sleep when I feel like it, whether it be night or day, and then when I wake up I can hunt. It all depends on how I feel. When you go hunting, what do you hunt? asked Old Mother Nature. Billy grinned. Anything that promises a good meal, said he. I'm not very particular. A fat mouse, a tender young rabbit, a chipmunk, a frog, tadpoles, chickens, eggs, birds, fish. Whatever happens to be easiest to get suits me. I am rather fond of fish, and that's one reason that I live along the Laughing Brook and around the Smiling Pool. But I like a change of fare, and so often I go hunting in the green forest. Sometimes I go up to Farmer Brown's for a chicken. In the spring I hunt for nests of birds on the ground. In winter, if Peter Rabbit should happen along here when I was hungry, I might be tempted to sample Peter. Billy snapped his bright eyes wickedly, and Peter shivered. If Jerry Muskrat were not my friend, I am afraid I might be tempted to sample him, continued Billy Mink. Pooh! exclaimed Peter Rabbit. You wouldn't dare tackle Jerry Muskrat. Wouldn't I? replied Billy. Just ask Jerry how he feels about it. One look at Jerry's face showed everybody that Jerry, big as he was, was afraid of Billy Mink. How do you hunt when you are on land? asked Old Mother Nature. The way every good hunter should hunt, with eyes, nose, and ears, replied Billy. There may be folks with better ears than I've got, but I don't know who they are. I wouldn't swap noses with anybody. As for my eyes, well, they are plenty good enough for me. In other words, you hunt very much as does your cousin, Shadow the Weasel, said Old Mother Nature. Billy nodded. I suppose I do, said he, but there's one thing he does which I don't do, and that's hunt just for the love of killing. Once in a while I may kill more than I can eat, but I don't mean to. I hunt for food, while he hunts just for the love of killing. You all saw how Billy catches fish, said Old Mother Nature. Now, Billy, I want you to swim over to the farther bank and show us how you run. Billy obeyed. He slipped into the water, dived, swam under water for a distance, then swam with just his head out. When he reached the bank, he climbed out and started along it. He went by a series of bounds, his back arched sharply between each leap. Then he disappeared before their very eyes, only to reappear as suddenly as he had gone. So quick were his movements that it was impossible for one of the little people watching to keep their eyes on him. It seemed sometimes as though he must have vanished into the air. Of course he didn't. He was simply showing them his wonderful ability to take advantage of every little stick, stone, and bush. Billy is a great traveler, said Old Mother Nature. He really loves to travel up and down the Laughing Brook, even for long distances. Wherever there is plenty of driftwood and rubbish, Billy is quite at home, being so slender he can slip under all kinds of places and into all sorts of holes. Quick as he is on land, he is not so quick as his cousin Shadow, and good swimmer as he is, he isn't so good as his bigger cousin, Little Joe Otter. But being equally at home on land and in water, he has an advantage over his cousins. Billy is much hunted for his fur, and being hunted so much has made him very keen-witted. Mrs. Billy makes her home nest in a hole in the bank or under an old stump or under a pile of driftwood, and you may be sure it is well hidden. There the babies are born, and they stay with their mother all summer. Incidentally, Billy can climb readily. Billy is found all over this great country of ours. When he lives in the far north, his fur is finer and thicker than when he lives in the south. I wish little Joe Otter were here. I hoped he would be. Here he comes now cried Jerry Muskrat. I rather expected he would be back. Jerry pointed towards where the Laughing Brook left the Smiling Pool on its way to the big river. 
A brown head was moving rapidly towards them. There was no mistaking that head. It could belong to no one but little Joe Otter. Straight on to the big rock he came and climbed up. He was big, being one of the largest members of his family. He was more than three feet long. But no one looking at him could mistake him for anyone but a member of the weasel family. His legs were short, very short for the length of his body. His tail was fairly long and broad. His coat was a rich brown all over, a little lighter underneath than on the back. "'What's going on here?' asked little Joe Otter, his eyes bright with interest. "'We are holding a session of school here today,' explained Old Mother Nature, "'and we were just hoping that you would appear. "'Hold up one of your feet and spread the toes, little Joe.' "'Little Joe Otter obeyed, though there was a funny, puzzled look on his face. "'Why, ee!' exclaimed Peter Rabbit. "'His toes are webbed like those of Paddy the Beaver.' "'Of course they're webbed,' said little Joe. "'I never could swim the way I do if they weren't webbed.' "'Can you swim better than Paddy the Beaver?' asked Peter. "'I should say I can. If I couldn't, I guess I would go hungry most of the time,' replied Little Joe. "'Why should you go hungry? Paddy doesn't,' retorted Peter. "'Paddy doesn't live on fish,' replied Little Joe. "'I do, and that's the difference. I can catch a fish in a tail-end race, and that's going some.' "'You might show us how you can swim,' suggested Old Mother Nature.' Little Joe slipped into the water. The smiling pool was very still, and the little people sitting on the bank could look right down and see nearly to the bottom. They saw Little Joe as he entered the water and then saw a little more than a brown streak. A second later, his head popped out on the other side of the smiling pool. Phew! I'm glad I'm not a fish, exclaimed Peter, and everybody laughed. "'You may well be glad,' said Old Mother Nature. "'You wouldn't stand much chance with Little Joe around. "'Like Billy Mink, Little Joe was a great traveler, "'especially up and down the Laughing Brook and the Big River. "'Sometimes he travels over land, "'but he is so heavy and his legs are so short "'that traveling on land is slow work. "'When he does cross from one stream or pond to another, "'he always picks out the smoothest going. "'Sometimes in winter he travels quite a bit.' Then when he comes to a smooth hill, he slides down it on his stomach. By the way, Little Joe, haven't you a slippery slide somewhere around here? Little Joe nodded. I've got one down the laughing brook where the bank is steep, said he. Mrs. Otter and I and our children slide every day. What do you mean by a slippery slide? asked Happy Jack Squirrel, who was sitting in the big hickory tree which grew on the bank of the smiling pool. Old Mother Nature smiled. "'Little Joe Otter and his family are quite as fond of play as any of my children,' said she. "'They get a lot of fun out of life. "'One of their ways of playing is to make a slippery slide where the bank is steep and the water deep. "'In winter it is made of snow, but in summer it is made of mud. "'There they slide down, splash into the water, then climb up the bank and do it all over again. "'In winter they make their slippery slide where the water doesn't freeze, "'and they get just as much fun in winter as they do in summer.' I suppose that means that Little Joe doesn't sleep in winter as Johnny Chuck does, said Peter. I should say not, exclaimed Little Joe. I like the winter, too. I have such a warm coat that I never get cold. There are always places where the water doesn't freeze. I can swim for long distances under ice, and so I can always get plenty of food. Do you eat anything but fish? asked Peter Rabbit. Oh, sometimes, replied Little Joe. Once in a while I like a little fresh meat for a change, and sometimes when fish are scarce I eat frogs, but I prefer fish, especially salmon and trout. How many babies do you have at a time? asked Happy Jack Squirrel. Usually one to three, replied Little Joe, and only one family a year. They are born in my comfortable house, which is a burrow in the bank. There Mrs. Otter makes a large soft nest of leaves and grass. Now if you don't mind, I think I will go on up the Laughing Brook. Mrs. Otter is waiting for me up there. Old Mother Nature told Little Joe to go ahead. As he disappeared, she sighed. I'm very fond of Little Joe Otter, said she, and it distresses me greatly that he is hunted by man as he is. That fur coat of his is valuable, and man is forever hunting him for it. The otters were once numerous all over this great country, but now they are very scarce, and I am afraid that the day isn't far away when there will be no Little Joe Otter. 
I think this will do for today. There are two other members of the weasel family, and these, like little Joe and Billy Mink, are continually being hunted for their fur coats. I will tell you about them tomorrow. End of chapter 25 Recording by Leanne Howlett Chapter 26 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Jamie Wilking. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 26 Spike the Martin and Pecan the Fisher. The Pine Martin or American Sable and the Fisher or Pennant Martin. The two remaining members of the weasel family none of you have ever seen, began Old Mother Nature, when she opened school at the old meeting place in the green forest the morning after their visit to the Smiling Pool. You have never seen them because they live in the deep forests of the far north. But were you living up there, you would know them, and the dread of them would seldom be out of your mind. One is called Spite the Martin, and the other Pecan the Fisher. Spite the Martin is also called the Pine Martin and the American Sable and he is one of the handsomest members of the weasel family. Shadow the weasel can climb, but he spends most of his time on the ground. Jimmy Skunk and Digger the Badger are not climbers at all. Little Joe Otter spends most of his time in the water. But Spike the Martin is a lover of the treetops, and is quite as much at home there as Chatterer the Red Squirrel. When he is moving about in the trees, he looks much like a very large squirrel, while on the ground he might be mistaken for a young fox. His coat is a rich, dark, yellowish-brown, becoming almost black on the tail and the legs. His throat usually is yellow, though sometimes it is almost white. The sides of his face are grayish, and his good-sized ears are grayish-white on the inside. His tail is about half as long as his body and is covered with long hair, but isn't bushy like a squirrel's. While his general shape is that of Shadow the Weasel, his body is much heavier in proportion to his size. Chatter, you and your cousin Happy Jack may well be thankful that Spite the Martin doesn't live around here, for he is very fond of squirrels and delights to hunt them. He can leap from tree to tree quite as easily as either of you, and the only possible means of escape for a squirrel he is hunting is a hole too small for Spite to get into. No squirrel is more graceful in the trees than is Spite. But he by no means confines himself to the trees. He is quite at home on the ground, and there he moves with much of the quickness of Shadow the Weasel. He delights to hunt rabbits, and he covers great distances, being even more of a traveler than Billy Mink. He doesn't kill for the love of killing, but merely for food. If he kills more than he can eat at the meal, he buries it, and when he's hungry again, he returns to it. Like all the other members of his family, he is a great hunter of mice. He also he catches many birds, especially those birds which nest on the ground. Birds, eggs, frogs, toads, some insects and fish vary his bill of fare. But unlike his smaller cousins, he eats some other things besides flesh, including certain nuts, berries, and honey. He isn't in the least social with his own kind, but prefers to live alone, and is always ready to fight if he meets another Martin. Being so great a traveler, he has several dens. Mrs. Spite makes her nest of grass and moss in a hollow tree as a rule, occasionally in a hole in the ground. She has from one to five babies in the spring. Spite is not a good father, for he has nothing to do with his family. As I told you in the beginning, he is found only in the great forests of the north. The darker and deeper they are, the better it suits him. His own cousin, Pecan the Fisher, and Tufty the Lynx, are probably the only natural enemies he has much cause to fear. His one great enemy is man. His coat is one of the most highly prized of all furs, and he is persistently hunted and trapped. In fact, his coat is one of the chief prizes of the fur trappers. In this same deep, dark forest, clear across the northern part of the country, lives Pecan the Fisher, also called the Pennant Martin and Black Cat. He is larger and heavier than Spike the Martin, and his coat is a brownish black, light on the sides, and browner below. His nose, ears, feet, and tail are black. He gets his name of Black Cat from his resemblance to a cat with a bushy tail, though on the ground he looks more like a black fox. Like his cousin, Spike the Martin, he lives in the pine and spruce forests, and prefers to be near swamps. He is a splendid climber, but spends quite as much time on the ground. However, he is even livelier in the trees than is Spite the Martin. Spite can catch a squirrel in the treetops, but Pecan can catch Spite, and often does. 
He isn't afraid of leaping to the ground from high up in a tree, and often when coming down a tree, he comes down head first. He is very fond of hunting the cousins of Jumper the Hare, and is so tireless that he can run them down. He is very clever, and like his cousin Glutton the Wolverine, makes no end of trouble for trappers by stealing the baits from their traps. You all remember how frightened Prickly Porky was when I merely mentioned Pecan the Fisher. It was because Pecan is almost the only one Prickly Porky has reason to fear. If Pecan is hungry, he doesn't hesitate to dine on Porcupine. He has learned how to turn a porcupine on his back, and as you have already found out, the under part of the porcupine is unprotected. Just why Pecan should be called Fisher, I don't know. True, he eats fish when he can get them, but he isn't a water animal and doesn't go fishing as do Billy Mink and Little Joe Otter. His food is much the same as that of Spite the Martin. He's especially fond of rabbit and hare. He is so strong and savage that he can kill a fox and often does. Bobby Coon is a good fighter and much bigger and heavier than Pecan, but he's no match for Pecan. Probably all of you have guessed that being a true Martin, Pecan's coat is highly prized by the fur trappers. He hates the presence of man and with good cause. Now this ends the weasel family, but that's only one family of the order of carnivora, or flesh eaters. There is one family you all know so well that I think we will take that up next. It is the family to which Reddy Fox and Old Man Coyote belong and it is called the dog family. Tomorrow morning when you get here, I may have a surprise for you. End of chapter 26、Twenty-seven. Recording by Jenna Lee. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess, Chapter Twenty Seven. Reddy Fox joins the school. The red, black, and silver foxes. Gray fox, Kit fox, or Swift. Desert fox, Arctic and blue foxes. When school was called to order the following morning, not one was missing. You see, with the exception of Jimmy Skunk and Prickly Porky, there was not one in whose life Reddy Fox did not have a most important part. Even Happy Jack the Gray Squirrel and Chatterer the Red Squirrel, tree folk though they were, had many times narrowly missed furnishing Reddy with a dinner. As for Johnny Chuck and Peter Rabbit and Jumper the Hare and Striped Chipmunk and Danny Meadow Mouse and Whitefoot the Wood Mouse, there were few hours of day or night when they did not have Reddy in mind. Knowing that to forget him even for a few minutes might mean the end of them. Just imagine the feelings of those little people when, just as they had comfortably seated themselves for the morning lesson, Reddy himself stepped out from behind a tree. Never before was a school so quickly broken up. In the winking of an eye, Old Mother Nature was alone, save for Reddy Fox, Jimmy Skunk, and in the trees Prickly Porky the Porcupine and Happy Jack the Chatterer. Reddy Fox looked as if he felt uncomfortable. "I didn't mean to break up your school," said he to Old Mother Nature. "I wouldn't have thought of coming if you hadn't sent for me." Old Mother Nature smiled. "I didn't tell anyone that I was going to send for you, Reddy," said she, "for I was afraid that if I did, no one would come this morning. I promised them a surprise, but it is clear that no one guessed what that surprise was to be." Go over by that old stump near the lone little path and sit there, Reddy. Then Old Mother Nature called each of the little people by name, commanding each to return at once. She spoke sternly, very sternly indeed. One by one they appeared from all sorts of hiding places, glancing fearfully towards Reddy Fox, yet not daring to disobey Old Mother Nature. When at last all were crowded about her as closely as they could get, Old Mother Nature spoke, and this time her voice was soft. "I am ashamed of you," said she. "Truly, I am ashamed of you. How could you think that I would allow any harm to come to you? Reddy Fox is here because I sent for him, but he is going to sit right where he is until I tell him he can go, and not one of you will be harmed by him. To begin with, I am going to tell you one or two facts about Reddy." And then I'm going to find out just how much you have learned about him yourselves. It may seem queer to you that Reddy Fox belongs to the same family as Bowser the Hound, but it is true. Both are members of the dog family and thus are quite closely related. 
Howler the Wolf and Old Man Coyote are also members of the family, so all are cousins. Look closely at Reddy, and you will see at once that he looks very much like a small dog with a beautiful red coat, white waistcoat, black feet, and bushy tail. Now, Peter, you probably know as much about Reddy as anyone here. At least you should. Tell us what you have learned in your efforts to keep out of his clutches. Peter scratched a long ear thoughtfully and glanced sideways at Reddy Fox. I certainly ought to know something about him, he began. He was the very first person my mother warned me to watch for, because she said he was especially fond of young rabbits and was the slyest, smartest, and most to be feared of all my enemies. Since then I have found out that she knew just what she was talking about. Johnny Chuck, Danny Meadow Mouse, and Whitefoot the Wood Mouse nodded as if they quite agreed. Then Peter continued, Reddy lives chiefly by hunting, and in his turn he is hunted, so he needs to have sharp wits. When he isn't hunting me, he is hunting Danny Meadow Mouse, or Whitefoot, or Striped Chipmunk, or Mrs. Grouse, or Bob White, or is trying to steal one of Farmer Brown's chickens, or is catching frogs along the edge of the Smiling Pool, or grasshoppers out in the green meadows. So far as I can make out, anything Reddy can catch furnishes him with food. I guess he doesn't eat anything but such things as these. "'Your guess is wrong, Peter,' spoke up Reddy Fox, who had been listening with a grin on his crafty face. "'I am rather fond of certain kinds of fruits. You didn't know that, did you, Peter?' "'No, I didn't,' replied Peter. "'I'm glad to know it. I think it is dreadful to live entirely by killing others.' "'You might add,' remarked Reddy, "'that I like a meal of fish occasionally, and eggs are always welcome. I am not particular what I eat, so long as I can get my stomach full.' Reddy Fox hunts with ears, eyes, and nose, continued Peter. Many a time I've watched him listening for the squeak of Danny Meadow Mouse, or watching for the grass to move and show where Danny was hiding. And many a time he has found my scent with his wonderful nose, and followed me just as Bowser the Hound follows him. I guess there isn't much going on that Reddy's eyes, ears, and nose don't tell him. But it is Reddy's quick wits that the rest of us fear most. We never know what new trick he will try. Lots of enemies are easy to fool, but Reddy isn't one of them. Sometimes I think he knows more about me than I know about myself. I guess it is just pure luck that he hasn't caught me with some of those smart tricks of his. Reddy hunts both day and night, but I think he prefers night. I guess it all depends on how hungry he is. More than once I've seen him bringing home a chicken, but I am told that he is smart enough not to steal chickens near his home, but always to go some distance to get them. Also, I've been told that he is too clever to go to the same chicken yard two nights in succession. So far as I know, he isn't afraid of anyone except a hunter with a terrible gun. He doesn't seem to mind being chased by Bowser the Hound at all. I don't, spoke up Reddy. I rather enjoy it. It gives me good exercise. Any time I can't fool Bowser by breaking my trail so he can't find it again, I deserve to be caught. I am not even so terribly afraid of a hunter with a gun. You see, usually I can guess what a hunter will do better than he can what I will do. Old Mother Nature nodded. That sounds like boasting, said she, but it isn't. Reddy Fox is one of the few animals who has succeeded in holding his own against man, and he has done it simply by using his wits. There is no other animal as large as Reddy Fox who has succeeded as he has in living close to the homes of men. It is simply because he has made the most of the senses I have given him. He has learned to use his eyes, ears, and nose at all times and to understand and make the most of the information they bring him. Reddy has always been hunted by man, and it is this very thing which has so sharpened his wits. It is seldom that he is guilty of making the same mistake twice. All of you little people fear Reddy, and I suspect some of you hate him. But always remember that he never kills for the love of killing, and only when he must have food. There would be something sadly missing in the green forests and on the green meadows where there no Reddy Fox. Reddy, where do you and Mrs. Reddy make your home, and how do you raise your babies? This year our home is up in the old pasture, replied Reddy. We have the nicest kind of a house dug in the ground underneath a big rock. It has only one entrance, but this is because there is no need of any other. No one could possibly dig us out there. Last year our home was on the green meadows, and there were three doorways to that. The year before, we dug our house in a gravelly bank just within the edge of the green forest. The babies are born in a comfortable bedroom deep underground. Sometimes we have a storeroom in addition to the bedroom. 
Their Mrs. Reddy and I can keep food when there is more than can be eaten at one meal. When the babies are first born in the spring and Mrs. Reddy cannot leave them, I take food to her. When the youngsters are big enough to use their sharp little teeth, we take turns hunting food for them. Usually we hunt separately, but sometimes we hunt together. You know often two can do what one cannot. If Bowser the Hound happens to find the trail of Mrs. Reddy when there are babies at home, she leads him far away from our home. Then I join her and take her place so that she can slip away and go back to the babies. Bowser never knows the difference. Our children are well trained, if I do say it. We teach them how to hunt, how to fool their enemies, and all the tricks we have learned. No one has a better training than a young fox. Here is a conundrum for you little folks, said Old Mother Nature. When is a red fox not a red fox? Everybody blinked. Most of them looked as if they thought Old Mother Nature must be joking. But suddenly Chatterer the Red Squirrel, whose wits are naturally quick, remembered how Old Mother Nature had told them that there were black gray squirrels. When he is some other color, cried Chatterer. That's the answer, said Old Mother Nature. Once in a while a pair of red foxes will have a baby who hasn't a red hair on him. He will be all black with perhaps just the tip of his tail white, or his fur will be all black just tipped with white. Then he is called a black fox or a silver fox. He is still a red fox, yet there is nothing red about him. Sometimes the fur is only partly marked with black, and then he is called a cross fox. A great many people have supposed that the black or silver fox and the cross fox were distinct kinds. They are not. They are simply red foxes with different coats. The fur of the silver fox is considered by man to be one of the choicest of all furs and tremendous prices are paid for it. This means, of course, that a young fox whose coat is black will need to be very smart indeed if he would live to old age, for once he has been seen by man he will be hunted unceasingly. Reddy Fox had been listening intently, and now Mother Nature noticed a worried look on his face. "'What is it, Reddy?' said she. "'You look anxious.' "'I am anxious,' said he. "'What you have just said has worried me. "'You see, one of my cubs at home is all black. "'Now that I have learned that his fur is so valuable, "'Mrs. Reddy and I will have to take special pains to teach him all we know. "'I want you all to know that Reddy Fox and Mrs. Reddy mate for life,' "'said Old Mother Nature. "'Reddy is the best of fathers and the best of mates.' "'There's one thing I do envy Reddy,' spoke up Peter Rabbit, "'and that is that big tail of his.' It is a wonderful tale. I wish I had one like it. How everybody laughed as they tried to picture Peter Rabbit with a big tail like that of Reddy Fox. I am afraid you wouldn't get far if you had to carry that around, said Old Mother Nature. Even Reddy finds it rather a burden in wet weather when it becomes heavy with water. That is one reason you do not find him abroad much when it is raining or in winter when the snow is soft and wet. Reddy Fox is at home all over the northern half of this country, and everywhere he is the same sly, clever fellow whom you all know so well. In the south and some parts of the east and west, Reddy has a cousin of about his own size whose coat is gray with red on the sides of his neck, ears, and across his breast. The under part of his body is reddish, his throat and the middle of his breast are white. He is called the gray fox. He prefers the green forest to the open country, for he is not nearly as smart as his cousin Reddy. He is, if anything, a better runner, but his wits are slower and he cannot so well hold his own up against man. Instead of making his home in a hole in the ground, he usually chooses a hollow tree trunk or hollow log. The babies are born in a nest of leaves in the bottom of a hollow tree. In some parts of the west, this fox is called the tree fox because often he climbs up in low trees. The gray fox of the south is not the only cousin of Reddy's, continued Old Mother Nature. In certain parts of the Great West, on the plains, lives one of the smallest of Reddy's cousins, called the Kit Fox, or Swift. He is no larger than Black Pussy, Farmer Brown's cat, and gets his name of Swift from his great speed in running. He is a prairie animal and lives in burrows in the ground, as most prairie animals do. His back is of a grayish color, while his sides are yellowish-red. Beneath he is white. The upper side of his tail is yellowish-gray. Below it is yellowish, and the tip is black. In general appearance, he is more like the gray fox than Reddy. He lacks the quick wit of Reddy Fox and is easily trapped. In the hot, dry regions of the southwest, where the kangaroo rats and pocket mice live, is another cousin closely related to the kit fox. This is called the desert fox. 
Like most of the little people who live on the desert, he is seldom seen by day. He is very swift of foot. He digs a burrow with several entrances, and his food consists largely of pocket mice, kangaroo rats, ground squirrels, and such other small animals as are found in that part of the country. Like his cousin, the kit fox, he is not especially quick-witted. Neither the kit fox nor the desert fox are considered very valuable for their coats, and so are not hunted and trapped as much as our reddy fox and his two cousins of the great north, the arctic fox and the blue fox. The arctic, or white fox, lives in the far north, in the land of snow and ice. He is a little fellow, bigger than the kit fox, but only about two-thirds the size of reddy fox, and very beautiful. Way up in the far north, his entire coat is snowy white the year round. The fur is long, very thick, and soft. His tail is very large and handsome. When he lives a little farther south, he changes his coat in the summer to one of a bluish brown. But just as soon as winter approaches, he resumes his white coat. The young are born in a burrow in the ground if the parents happen to be living far enough south for the ground to be free of snow. In the far north, their home is a burrow in a snowbank, and there the babies are born. The white coats of the arctic foxes, who live in a world of white, are of great help to them when hunting or when trying to escape from enemies. It is difficult to see them against their white surroundings. In summer their food consists very largely of duck and other wild fowl which nest in great numbers in the far north. In the winter they hunt for lemmings, arctic hares, and a cousin of Mrs. Grouse called the ptarmigan who lives up there. They pick the bones left by polar bears and wolves. Getting a living in winter is not easy, and so the arctic fox is a great traveler. The blue fox is really only a colored white fox, just as the black fox is a black red fox, and his habits are, of course, just the same as the habits of the white fox. There are some islands in the far north called the Pribilof Islands, and on them live many blue foxes. Both the white and the blue foxes are much hunted for their coats, which are considered very valuable by man. Certainly they are very beautiful. While these cousins of Reddy's are clever hunters, they do not begin to be as quick-witted as Reddy, and so are much more easily trapped. Now I think this will do for Reddy Fox and his relatives. Reddy is going to stay right here with me until the rest of you have had a chance to get home. After that, you will have to watch out for yourselves as usual. Just remember that Reddy has become the quick-witted person he is because he has been so much hunted. If you are as smart as Reddy, you will understand that the more he hunts you, the quicker witted you will also become. Tomorrow we will take up Reddy's big cousins, the wolves. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenna Lee. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 28 Old Man Coyote and Howler the Wolf. The Prairie Wolf or Coyote and the Timber or Gray Wolf. Of course, you all know to what branch of the dog family Old Man Coyote belongs, said Old Mother Nature, and looked expectantly at the circle of little folks gathered around her. No one answered. Well, 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 exclaimed Old Mother Nature. I am surprised. I am very much surprised. I supposed that all of you knew that Old Man Coyote is a member of the wolf branch of the family. Do you mean that he is really a true wolf? asked Striped Chipmunk timidly. "'Of course,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'He is all wolf and nothing but wolf. "'He is the prairie wolf, "'so called because he is a lover of the great open plains "'and not of the deep forests, "'like his big cousin, Howler the Timber Wolf. "'Reddy Fox is smart, "'but sometimes I believe Old Man Coyote is smarter. "'You have got to get up very early indeed "'to get ahead of Old Man Coyote. "'Old Man Coyote varies in size "'from not very much bigger than Reddy Fox.' to almost the size of his big cousin, Howler the Timber Wolf. Also, he varies in color from a general brownish-gray to a yellowish-brown, being whitish underneath. His face is rather longer than that of Reddy Fox. He has a brushy tail, but it is not as thick as Reddy's. In his habits, Old Man Coyote is much like Reddy, 
but being larger and stronger he is able to kill larger animals, and has won the hate of man by killing young pigs, lambs, newly born calves, and poultry. Because of this he has been and is continually hunted and trapped. But like Reddy Fox, the more he is hunted the smarter he becomes, and he is quite capable of taking care of himself. He is one of the swiftest of all runners. Many people think him cowardly because he is always ready to run away at the least hint of danger. He isn't cowardly, however. He is simply smart, too smart to run any unnecessary risk. Old Man Coyote believes absolutely in safety first, a very wise rule for everybody. The result is that he is seldom led into the mistake of simply thinking a thing is all right. He makes sure that it is all right. Because of this, he is very hard to trap. No matter how hungry he may be, he will turn his back on a baited trap, even when the trap is so cunningly hidden that he cannot see it. Old Man Coyote is a good father and husband and a good provider for his family. He and Mrs. Coyote have a large family every year, sometimes as many as ten babies. Their home is in the ground and is very similar to that of Reddy Fox. They eat almost everything eatable, including such animals and birds as they can catch frogs, toads, snakes, and insects, dead bodies they may find, and even some fruits. Mr. and Mrs. Coyote often hunt together. Sometimes, when the children are full grown, they all hunt together. When they do this, they can pull down Lightfoot the deer. Old Man Coyote has one of the strangest voices to be heard anywhere, and he delights to use it, especially at night. It is like many voices shouting together, and one who hears it for the first time cannot believe all that sound comes from one throat. His big cousin, Howler the Gray Wolf, sometimes called Timber Wolf, is found now only in the forests of the north and the mountains of the Great West. Once he roamed over the greater part of this great country. Howler is as keen-witted as, and perhaps keener-witted than, Reddy Fox or Old Man Coyote, and added to this he has great strength and courage. He is one of the most feared of all the people of the green forest. In summer, when food is plentiful, Howler and Mrs. Wolf devote themselves to the bringing up of their family and are careful not to be overbold. But when winter comes, Howler and his friends get together and hunt in packs. With their wonderful noses, they can follow Lightfoot the deer and run him down. They kill sheep and young cattle. The harder the winter, the bolder they become, and they have been known to attack man himself. In the far north they grow especially large, and because of the scarcity of food there in winter, they become exceedingly fierce. They can go an astonishingly long time without food, and still retain their strength. But hunger makes them merciless. They will not attack each other, but if one in the pack becomes injured, the others will turn upon him and kill and eat him at once. Howler and Mrs. Wolf mate for life, and each is at all times loyal to the other. They are the best of parents, and the little wolves are carefully trained in all that a wolf should know. Always the hand of man has been against them, and this fact has developed their wits and cunning to a wonderful degree. Man, in his effort to destroy them, has used poison, cleverly hiding it in pieces of meat left where Howler and his friends could find them. Howler soon found out that there was something wrong with pieces of meat left about, and now it is seldom that any of his family come to harm in that way. He is equally cunning in discovering traps, even traps buried in one of his trails. Sometimes he will dig them up and spring them without being caught. When wolves hunt in packs, they have a leader, usually the strongest or the smartest among them, and this leader they obey. In all the great forests, there is no more dreadful sound than the howling of a pack of wolves. There is something in it that strikes terror to the hearts of all who hear it. The color of Howler's coat usually is brownish-gray, and that is why he is called the Gray Wolf, but sometimes it is almost black, and in the far north it becomes snowy white. Howler is very closely related to the dogs which men keep as pets. They are really first cousins. Few dogs dare meet Howler in battle. My! exclaimed Peter Rabbit. I am glad Howler doesn't live around here. You may well be, said Old Mother Nature. He would make just about one bite of you, Peter. Peter shivered. "'Are Old Man Coyote and Howler friends?' asked Peter. "'I wouldn't call them exactly friends,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'Old Man Coyote takes pains to keep out of Howler's way, "'but he is clever enough to know that when Howler has made a good kill, "'there may be some left after Howler has filled his own stomach. 
So when Howler is hunting in Old Man Coyote's neighborhood, the latter keeps an eye and ear open to what is going on. In the long-ago days when Thunderfoot the bison was lord of the prairies, Howler's family lived on the prairies as well as in the forests, but now Howler sticks pretty closely to the forests and mountains, leaving the prairies and brushy plains to Old Man Coyote. All branches of the dog family do one thing. They walk on their toes. They never put the whole foot down flat as does Buster Bear. And, as you have already discovered, all branches of the dog family are very smart. They are intelligent. Hello, there is Black Pussy, the cat from Farmer Brown's, coming down the lone little path. I suspect it will be well for some of you smallest ones to get out of sight before she arrives. She doesn't belong over here in the green forest, but she has a cousin who does, Yowler the Bobcat. Shall I tell you about Yowler and his cousins tomorrow? We'd love to have you, cried Happy Jack, speaking for all. Then, as Black Pussy was drawing near, they separated and went their several ways. End of chapter 28